Warning. This video contains images some might find disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey guys, Tyler here. So if you've been a fan of my channel for quite a long time, you'll probably know that I've made plenty of videos about cybernetics, the merging of biology with technology. The Borg in Star Trek are one of the most well-known examples of this, and their role as an antagonist in multiple series and films serves as a counter to the Federation's humanistic philosophy, for lack of a better word. The Borg assimilate unwilling individuals into their collective, and Borg drones are essentially devoid of personality, instead serving the hive mind. At the end of the day, however, they're still organic beings who have simply been augmented with technology technology that directly interfaces with their nervous systems. Similarly, the observers from Fringe are also partially cybernetic beings from the future. I've made several videos over the years about Fringe, which aired on the Fox network from 2008 to 2013. It started out as a procedural drama, a la The X-Files, but by the end of the second season it became about a war between two parallel universes. This show is something else. But while most of my Fringe videos are about the parallel universe itself, one aspect of Fringe that I haven't covered in as much detail is the lore behind the Observers. The Observers appear in every episode, but for most of the show's runtime, they remain quite elusive. It's only in the final season that we learn that they're actually humans from the year 2609, and they've traveled back in time to study the past, or present, in the show's continuity, in prelude for an invasion. As I've conducted research on the Borg and the Observers over the years, I've noticed just how many characteristics they share. So in today's video, I'm going to show you how Fringe's Observers are just like the Borg. First things first, to call the Observers or the Borg villains is a bit one-dimensional, and they're anything but one-dimensional. They're more like five-dimensional. String theory joke. No, in all seriousness, the Borg are carrying out their own prime directive to assimilate uh, as much knowledge and technology as they possibly can to improve themselves, even if their methods are decidedly forceful. By the same token, the observers who we meet for most of Fringe's runtime are actually more curious than anything. They're scientists. They're not even truly aware of the real purpose of their mission, which is to find a suitable period for colonization by their superiors. In any case, while there are numerous differences, of course, between the Borg and the observers, the parallels are just too uncanny to mention. So enough beating around the bush, let's actually dive into this. Number one, both are cybernetic. Let's start with the big one, the feature that's most obvious about the Borg, but not so obvious about the observers. Whereas the Borg's cybernetic nature is far more apparent the first time we meet them, with the observers it's far more subtle. We get glimpses of observer technology throughout the show, but season 5 in particular is where we learn how some of their most intricate tools work. We don't know if they use nanotechnology like the Borg do, but I'd wager it's likely. Given the observer's ability to teleport across time and space, it's clear that they're capable of engineering on very small scales, probably the quantum scale. Take, for example, their cybernetic implants. As we see, the implant that gives the observers their abilities can be given to anyone through an incision. The implant then connects itself to the spinal cord, giving the subject abilities such as enhanced vision, teleportation, and calculative precognition. The technology even creates new ridges in the brain to increase rational thinking, called controlled evolution. This has the result of destroying the emotion centers of the brain. When the character Peter Bishop augments himself with observer technology to gain a tactical advantage, he slowly loses his humanity and must be coaxed to remove the implant before it fades away completely. This gives us some insight into the observer's biological distinction from present-day humans, a distinction that is expounded upon in one observer's oral retelling of his people's history. In 2167, in Oslo, Norway, scientists experimenting on the human brain figure out that they can increase intelligence by rewiring the part of the brain that controls jealousy. Over the years, more negative emotions, anger, sadness, fear, etc., are also overwritten to increase capacity for rational thought, until even positive emotions—love, joy, empathy 
are sacrificed as well. Eventually, every human on Earth, as far as we can tell, is enhanced in this way, creating a society of automatons. It's like a slow Borg assimilation of a species over centuries instead of all at once. Resistance is futile. Speaking of emotions, number two, they both have suppressed emotions. The Borg drones we meet on screen are, when they're hooked up to the collective, more like robots than organic beings. It's a long process to get a drone to rediscover their humanity after they're severed from the collective, as is the case with Hugh in The Next Generation and Seven of Nine in Voyager. But just as these ex-Borg are able to rediscover what it means to be human, so too are the observers capable of this. The observer scientists introduced in the early seasons, a team of 12 codenamed after a different calendar month, gradually become attached to the 21st century humans that they're studying. One even falls in love, though this gets him killed. There's got to be some kind of metaphor in there. Their mannerisms are quite peculiar. Their speech is monotone, and they often tilt their heads when interacting with others, which we learn is to change the angle at which sound waves hit the eardrum, allowing in more stimuli. The character Nina Sharp compares this involuntary reflex to the behavior of lizards. Their brains have evolved over 320 million years, but for all that development, she says, they are incapable of forming bonds, like love. In that way, the observers have actually regressed. That said, the observer scientists' extended exposure to present-day humans triggers base levels of empathy that their kind hasn't experienced in centuries, and they even aid and abet the resistance against the observer occupying force in 2036. I took a risk even coming to see you because I believe that the people of this era are worth saving. Number three both possess time travel. This one is rather obvious given everything we've just discussed, but while the Borg's most prominent foray into time travel is their attempt to change history in Star Trek First Contact, time travel is more of a defining characteristic of the observers. After all, they're called that because they're here to observe the past. Recordings of their visits actually stretch back 5,000 years, we learn. In the words of Brandon Fayette, a scientist for the ominous Massive Dynamic megacorporation, These guys show up at important moments, um, historical, technological, scientific, but it's rare. Some of these events include the Boston Massacre. Oh, come on. Well, there could be anybody the assassinations of Marie Antoinette and Franz Ferdinand, and over two dozen sightings in the early 2010s. That's right, we're living in a very important time in history. What a time to be alive, am I right? Observer time travel is also one of the catalysts that kicked off the overall plot of Fringe in the first place. We find out in the episode Peter that the show's prime timeline is actually the result of a mistake by one observer, September. In 1985, September watches Dr. Walter Bishop's alternate universe counterpart synthesize a cure for his dying son Peter's terminal illness. Meanwhile, the Dr. Bishop from our side is watching these events unfold through a transdimensional window he has constructed with 1980s technology, mind you. September accidentally distracts alternate Dr. Bishop and he misses an important color change indicator in the compound he's creating. This prompts our Dr. Bishop to cross over and, well, abduct the other Peter to bring him back over here and cure him. His son, our Peter, had already died beforehand. September is informed that he will have an opportunity to fix this mistake, setting the events of the show into motion. Where are we going? Where are we taking the car? We can't get where we're going in a car. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Number four, both can withstand environments that are toxic to us. In First Contact, when the Borg Sphere travels through a temporal vortex to Earth's past, the Enterprise E is caught in a temporal wake. Here they observe an alternate timeline that temporarily exists as a result of the Borg assimilating Earth. According to data, this alternate Earth has an atmosphere with high concentrations of methane, carbon monoxide, and fluorine, all of which are either greenhouse or otherwise poisonous gases. The possibility of showing a Borg assimilated Earth in first contact was discussed early on in the film's development process. 
the assimilated Earth was created using CGI by Industrial Light and Magic's Alex Yeager, who also supervised the visual effects for the Battle of Sector 001. Yeager depicted the polluted planet's surface with a series of digital matte paintings. Details barely visible in the final film include industrial pipes stretching across the oceans, and the oceans were colored brown on the insistence of director Jonathan Frakes. Jaeger desaturated all the land masses so they would appear gray, covered in Borg power plants and machinery, and gave the atmosphere a yellow-green tint. Notably in their time frame, the observers also breathe a little bit of carbon monoxide in addition to the other gases that regularly characterize the atmosphere. They've effectively ruined the planet by extracting virtually every resource and polluting the environment beyond recognition. During their 21-year reign on present-day Earth, they construct several giant machines around the planet, including in Central Park, to pump carbon monoxide into the atmosphere to match 2609 levels. Owing to their callous disregard for the well-being of their 21st century subjects. What did you do up there in the future to get yourself such a crap detail? I like animals. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are clearly uh, multiple differences between the Borg and the Observers. For example, it would be inaccurate to say that they're both totally impervious to weapons fire. We see on multiple occasions that Borg drones can adapt to phaser fire by constructing force fields around themselves. But while the Observers can technically catch bullets in midair, they're not exactly bulletproof. For example, in Season 4, we see that September has sustained a nearly lethal gunshot wound. And while Borg drones are assimilated from already living beings, observers are actually grown in tanks using DNA from designated male donors. Meaning in this world, cloning has effectively replaced the need for females and sexual reproduction. That said, this would seem to severely limit the gene pool. So uh, I'm not really sure what's going on here. The observers are also not a hive mind, though they are capable of mind reading, which they use in interrogations. They perceive time non-linearly, while Borg drones are actually uh, limited to three dimensions. And of course, the observers are a single species, while the Borg collective includes thousands. Does this mean that we're destined to become like the observers or even the Borg? Well. Maybe, maybe not. Certainly over the next several centuries, I can see cybernetic enhancements becoming more common. Those I've explored in previous videos, I'm skeptical as to how quickly, if at all, that these enhancements would be adopted by the entire population. If we're not careful, we could actually ruin the planet, much as the observers have, but it's their lack of emotional intelligence that actually makes them incapable of caring for the environment. And of course, time travel in the way that they practice it runs contrary to everything we know about physics, so that one is probably off the table. Nevertheless, Fringe does offer one glimmer of hope about its dark future. As in the series finale, Dr. Bishop sacrifices his chance at living out the rest of a normal life by traveling to the future with Michael, a child observer and the son of September. Michael's unique brain chemistry allows him to uh, possess both increased intelligence and increased empathy. Part of the plan to overthrow the occupying force is to show the scientists in Oslo, Norway that both both can coexist, and it's this alteration that ultimately leads to the timeline being reset. Thank you all so much for watching. This is clearly only a fraction of the information that I could talk about about the observers and the board, but I wanted to share their similarities in this video. As always, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. It really does. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you think I deserve it and you want to support the channel even further, you can become a patron or a member. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description below. That's all I have for this week. I'll see you in the next video.